I am Ira Kirschbaum. I'm the editor of the Journal for Orthopedic Experience and Innovation. Uh, tonight, uh, we have a um, excellent panel for a very important topic um, for a very important operations for very important operations. Perioperative pain strategies in shoulder surgery. Um, uh, I think that this is a very uh, painful operation. <laughs> Most of, most of the time, um, um, unless you're just sticking a scope in and taking it out, you know, then, then of course there are other issues you will have. But I'd also like to first of all um, recognize that we have two panelists, uh, Sharif Bishay and Vani Sabizan. I'd like you guys to introduce yourself. Vani, why don't you start yourself? To tell us anything you want to say about yourself, even though. Yeah, so I'm a shoulder surgeon down in Palm Beach. I was in Michigan for a number of years, so I knew Sharif well. And I um, I think I would say I have been pretty passionate about the idea of pain, opioid sparing, how to improve the recovery of my patients after shoulder surgery for about 14 years of my career. So this is a topic near and dear to my heart, and I'm really honored to be part of anything that Ira does, but especially these Joey's, uh, Joey panels. And more excitingly, just sort of to see where Joey's gone, the, the, the popularity, the rise, and the relevance that we hope that we bring. Thank you. Sharif? Yeah, I'm Sharif Bichet. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, primarily sports and shoulder, but primarily shoulder, about 90% of my practice. I've been in practice for about 18 years, and I've been, again, I, like Vani, very passionate about doing things that will help patients get better faster with the least amount of pain using different approaches, including multimodal approaches, which we can talk about later. And uh, to the point where I actually went to uh, the U.S. Capitol and lobbied for the No Pain Act a few years back. So this is something that I am very proud of, uh, that as shoulder surgeons, we've reunited together to really make it a better experience for our patients while making them better. Okay. Um, I want to mention that this is an open forum. So if you have any questions at any point in time, put them in the chat. Uh, I will ask, I will ask you to um, show your video and ask your question to the group. And as you know, in most uh, open mic session, anything goes. Um, um, yes, there are dumb questions, but anything goes. <laughs> so we'll take it from there let me start uh with a question like anything else the question is what is the nature of the of the issue in shoulder surgery how how bad is this issue you know we uh related to pain you know how painful are shoulder ops and which are the most painful and what's the nature of the pain you know sharif let's start with you for a second so i'll start with uh some anecdotal information. And I will say that as a resident, I knew I wanted to go into sports medicine. However, I did not want to do shoulder for the fact that I would watch these patients be in so much pain. So I would, I said to myself once, I will never do shoulder surgeries in practice. I just don't want to deal with these patients with this much pain. And ironically, 90% of my practice now is shoulder. Why did it change is because I think we got smarter. Um, one of the first weekends I was ever on call about 18 years ago, I got a call from a pharmacy saying, can you fill this prescription for 240 Oxycontin? And I was like, uh, no, that, that, that can't be real. So I got walk into my office on that Monday morning and my senior partner who was, you know, at one point in the executive uh, line for the academy. So he's a well-known, well-respected surgeon, but he was older, much older than me, said, I heard that you nixed my prescription for 240 pills for that patient. So I realized really quickly that there was an issue and that we needed to do a better job to try to fix that issue. And from the beginning, I've, I've been listening to the shoulder part, the techniques, all that stuff. We, we kind of figured that out. We kind of pseudo agree on it. But this is something that I think was different and it needed to be addressed. And that's when I really got passionate about it. And over the years, it took many years and there's been many pioneers before us that have come. But I think Vani and I have jumped on this and really worked hard to work with our patients and with our hospitals and with our anesthesiologists and talk and set up processes to, for multimodal techniques. And now I will tell you that 
shoulder surgery is not painful. I can tell you that most of my patients will get 10 Norco 7.5s, not even Oxycontins. And most of those patients, regardless of open or closed procedure, will not require a refill. And it's because of education. It's because you explain to them you will have pain. It's okay. It's not these are not pain. These are not surgeries we do that have no pain. But the pain is manageable. My goal for that patient is to be uncomfortably comfortable or comfortably uncomfortable, whichever way you want to say it. But it can be done. I had surgery myself. I took one pill. I had the same bupivacaine, this liposomal bupivacaine during my surgery. And I, I took one pill because I thought at that point I might hurt, but that was one pill I probably didn't even need. So it can be done. It can be opioid sparing, just like Paul Sethi's paper in your journal a couple of years ago. So, you know, Vani, what do you think? I mean, I think you summarized it well, but I think, you know, I think the thing uh, that is most interesting that I think is that we're here today. The fact that I think 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when Sharif and I were training, these were not conversations you had with patients, right? These were not educational tools you provided them. You talked about the technique of it. You talked about the rehab. You talked about the healing. But we really didn't talk about the expectations of how do you recover and how do patients feel. I think the evolution of understanding and the pain scale, if you look at this, this is you know a societal thing where we really went all the way to the one spectrum where everything, no one could leave with pain, right? No one could have pain, no one should have pain, and that was the expectation set. And I think we've come to a really nice middle ground where it's like, you know, you can have pain and you will have pain. So that's one, an expectation set. And then two, we're going to figure out other ways to manage it. And I think that that's really the evolution. But, you know, I think rotator cuff repairs, you know, inevitably, we used to survey patients and talk to patients about it. And, you know, 56 pills was the average given. So, I mean, it was a painful procedure that we sort of had these expectations and had these high levels of pain. And then I'd say shoulder surgery, I think the most interesting thing about shoulder replacement surgery is although we might not think of it as painful, many, many patients would come in having been on oxycodone or these narcotics for years, right? Because they were holding off on getting a shoulder replacement. So the standard of care became, we'll give you pain medicines until you can't survive with the pain medicines, and then we'll do surgery. So these conversations are an evolution for both our surgeons, our patients, and societally, the understanding of what we do. And I'll jump, can I jump in real quick, Ira? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think pain became a vital sign. And when it became that fifth vital sign, that became a problem because somebody be, had said, oh, it needs to be at a zero or one. Well, you just had a surgery. I mean, three or four or even five is fine, but let us figure out how to help you contain it to a two or a three. So when people were being told that, oh, if it's not a one or a two or a zero, we need to pump these people full of opiates. And again, I don't blame my predecessors. That's what we knew. That's what we thought. And there's a reason Netflix came out with these these docu-series on the Sackler family on the creators of Oxycontin is because it became a marketing machine and it was industry driving healthcare. And that's part of the reasons we got here. And I, I don't blame anybody. It's just, it's hard to beat marketing that is in your face, that is being marketed to patients, that is being told to them that you don't need to ever have pain. We have something for you. But, you know, little did we know all the things that came with it. And it was safe and effective, not addictive, Correct. never going to hurt you. Correct. You know, um, I just want to comment that uh, what Sharif talked about, the fifth vital sign, that actually was from the Joint Commission, believe it or not, you know, which, which they're hiding from their uh, history on that. Uh, but the Joint Commission called pain a fifth vital sign and hospitals were cited. Correct. Because cited. the press Ganey scores went down yeah. because therefore, so it was the hospitals would then push for more narcotics so that they would get a better score. And therefore it came at the expense of the patients. I right. mean, we had demand pumps guys for patients in the hospital. Every what one hour you could max out, right? Yep. How many times you pushed it. And that's where we were when that joint commission created this. I remember, um, <clears throat> When I was first in practice, I did general orthopedics, so they, they allowed me to do some shoulder surgery. 
Um, I got I got a pass and they, I was allowed to do some shoulder surgery. But I remember there was a I forgot the company who did, but there was a continuous infusion lidocaine pump. Yep. Right in the shoulder, right intraarticular. Intraarticular. Yep. Yeah. And, that didn't uh, turn out well. Didn't yeah. turn out well. A chondrolysis, yeah. you know, yes. and yeah. other things. But nonetheless, that's how that's how aggressively people would agreeing to to manage pain all right so let, let me let me ask you guys um let's talk about i want to show share my screen for a second and show um this particular article uh, th this just talks about this was originally this was the article by paul sethi in uh february 22 you got 2500 page views uh which is quite a lot for any article um uh or or paul has a huge family um whatever, whatever, whatever <laughs> he's got a huge is. fan club the I think it's, it's okay yeah fan club there was i knew it was like the patels you know yeah it's like the Sethies. so he has a pre-operative cocktail and a post-operative cocktail in in addition to the inter liposomal pitocaine interscaling block um um, could you tell us about do you do do you guys do something like this preoperatively? And, yeah, so, and so what's your what's your protocol? So this the preoperative part is exactly what I do. I give gabapentin. Actually, I give two hundred Celebrex. I give uh, a gram of Affirmiv or or Tylenol or Acetaminophen. I do the uh, Expro block, and then they also get Decadron. Postoperatively, I don't give oxycodone. I think the most the most I'll give is a seven point five hydrocodone, and it's essentially one. Then they go on Mobic seven point five. I I don't think it makes a big difference with bone healing, integration of bone into a total shoulder, or even healing of the tendon. I've been doing it for eighteen years, haven't seen an issue, and there's multiple papers that show both sides of that. So I'm on the side that it doesn't make a difference. And then I'm a big fan of cryotherapy, so a lot of ice. And that's really all I use. So I don't even use the affirmative gabapentin, but I use an anti-inflammatory after, and that's it. Bonnie? So I do a tiny bit different. Um, I think I obviously the liposomal interscaling block is one thing I'm sure uh, Sharif and I both use. I think the Decadron is critical. There's been a lot of new literature coming out that although we had fear of using steroids, that the steroids seem to be safe in this pre perioperative period. I think the thing I do is I use Toradol or Ketorolac for an acute post-op pain for the first three days. That's not on here. And then I switch to like a Meloxicam or a Mobic. And then I don't give gabapentin post-operatively. I've had a lot of issues. If you look at, you know, sort of the gabapentin sort of half-life and how that responsiveness is, it's really not an acute sort of thing. So it takes quite a long time to sort of titrate up. And I got a lot of questions, concerns with that. So I kind of have eliminated that in the post-op myself. Yeah, so we're both very similar. And I, I think even in two years, that much has changed that we probably can get rid of the oxycodone. Right. Do you change differently for a shoulder arthroplasty? Exactly or the same. For me, I think that I do give uh, oxycodone for a few pills for my, um, for both actually, but probably a little bit more on the arthroscopy side than the arthroplasty. But in general, I do give a rescue dose. We looked at this. I did 100 patients, and we published ours on opioid-free. The educational part is critical. And then we actually had the average of patients out of that opioid-free group was about two pills. So the big issue for me is, you know, when patients need those pills, they don't have access to them. So I do provide that. And sort of interestingly enough, even when we did that, we only had the average of two pills, and everyone by 48 hours was off them. So it seemed to be in that acute period that people really needed them for a couple of pills and then didn't need anything. It's interesting. I, you know, I, I, uh, that anecdote you told me about your senior partner, uh, Sharif is very interesting. I, me being a senior partner right now. <laughs> and I, and I very much remember those days. Uh, I will tell a brief anecdote myself about this. Um, Call them the candy man, Ira. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, you know, if you if you can sell it for Percocet on Jerome Avenue in the Bronx, <laughs> you're okay. Um, I'll trade you for Yankee tickets. You know, so, but <laughs> I get a call from a pharmacist who says, we have a prescription for narcotics from you. 
um, but we're not sure it's your uh, it's uh, valid. I said, you know, uh, what's the patient's name? Tell me the name. Yeah, the patient just had surgery. It was pretty painful surgery, and yeah, I, I wrote for pain meds. He says, I know maybe, but I'm not sure it's your prescription. He said, Well, what do you mean? He says, It says a pound of morphine, M O F E N E. So this is what you're dealing with with patients sometimes who are, <laughs> you know, manipulating the system. Um, how you know, on the flip side of that, now, you know, we have to also talk about just the fact that the pharmacy has become a relevant part of that conversation. Yes. So, you know, we talk about these things. <laughs> You know, and, and, you know, you try to give patients in need if they are these type of prescriptions and the pharmacy might not have it or the pharmacist doesn't think you should give it or they have looked in 10 weeks ago, they got another one or I mean, so they have become a really relevant factor in that that sort of supersedes us as surgeons in terms of relevance of who's going to get access to these things. And I'm okay with it if Vani writes for a script and then I write for a script and then you write for a script and the pharmacist plays a role in essentially gatekeeping because and in the state of Michigan, we have maps, which is the, and I don't know how it is in Florida and New York, but I can see where all those scripts are coming from. But at the yeah. time I write for it, I might not see that. And therefore it's good that there's somebody who's overseeing it. However, I agree with Vani. There's times where I might see that patient and it's probably one out of 50 that I'll see that comes in and we see our patients post up day one on the outpatient procedures, the PA sees them and they might need something stronger and we'll write them for maybe like she said, two or five or whatever, something, maybe a Percocet five instead of the Norco seven fives. And we'll get a call back a couple hours later saying they just fill the Norco. Why are they getting the Percocet? And we will put on the prescription for breakthrough pay Norco not covering post-surgical. And they'll still not give it to the patient. So uh, that's problematic where the the pharmacist feels that the need to protect the insurance company and saying they just filled a script versus doing something that's good for the patient. So I think that the theme here is insurance now is getting involved saying, well, if you wrote it for every six hours, they shouldn't be filling this for three and a half days. So now they're at three and one quarter days. They can't fill it out till... 4 p.m. this afternoon. I mean, it's it's gotten ridiculous in that respect. You know, and remember yourself, now we're talking about legislature that's going to disincentivize writing for these things, filling these things, doing this type of thing, right, for the No Pain Act. So, you know, the problem becomes there is that absolutely, I think we're very successful at what we do. But, you know, I presented at ASES, there are people at risk for high pain. And yeah. that's just a reality. Not everyone fits one box, just like mm -hmm. cherry picking, you know, and, and doing these things in terms of how we did joint replacements. If we expect no one to have pain after surgery ever, I mean, that's an expectation that maybe some people will reach, but not everyone. And so do we like disenfranchise the people that do have that just because they might have this initial post-op pain, but they might have a great recovery in three months or two months or whatever it is. No, you're absolutely point. right. Yeah, I think it's a great point. Um, you know, it's interesting. It is the No Pain Act. It's not the No Opioid Act. Yeah. Right. And so there are many modalities you can use, but there are people who are at risk. I mean, I have I have people who you inject the shoulder, they don't they don't do anything in the office. I have others you inject the shoulder, they're screaming. They're they're and it's the same injection. You yeah. know. So so pain approaches are different. I want to do talk about two things. First, transition transitional pain, pain from two days to 30 days, and then back again to the use of interscaling blocks or infiltration. We'll, we'll talk about that. What have you seen in shoulder surgery? If you've controlled the pain for the first 72 hours well, what's happening from 72 hours to 30 days? Okay, in your experience. I, I will say that in my practice, after that storm of pain, which is usually within the first four days, if you can get them through that, they should be good. And when I'm at that point, I rely on anti-inflammatory and ice. That's it. And most patients, I will tell you, in the high 90 percentile in my practice, that's all they'll need. If it is rare probably less than 5% of my practice will need a re refill. And definitely by two weeks, I will say about 95% of my practice 
after a surgery will be off of narcotics. And so, you know, there's a question in the chat, what is the balance between pain control and, and possible loss of motion? And I think it's a great question because the reality is if they don't have much pain, they're going to be able to, if they're in therapy already, they should be already feeling better. I still use CPMs. I'm old school like that. I have them using CPMs from as soon as they can deliver it to the house. So it could be post-op day two of a, of a cuff. They're already moving it. I don't tell them to move it to 90 degrees. I say, move what you can start at 30 degrees, work your way up two to five degrees a day. So I think much of why I think the pain can be controlled is the conversation and education at the pre-op appointment and not just them kind of flying blind and not knowing what to expect. I think if they know what to expect, you're going to be uncomfortable. You're going to have soreness. I, I try not to use the term pain because I go, soreness is going to hurt. It's going to get better after you stop doing that activity. If it's pain that's sustained, then I need to know about that. More often than that, what's happening is they have this really strong soreness and they take these pills for it and they feel better, but then they don't, they're exhausted, they're tired, they're not sleeping well, the narcotics are getting bored, they're constipated. They have all these other side effects and then they come in and say, I need more of those pills. But it's not necessarily because of quote unquote pain. Vani? I would say that there's, you know, there, the reality is not everyone fits in that. And Sharif has a better population than I, because, you know, I would say that, you know, the, the reality is therapy can be painful. Moving it can be painful. Right. So I think there's that acute sort of nociception of pain that definitely Sharif talks about. And I think it goes up to two weeks. I think if you look at the literature, I just did a high risk talk in about shoulder surgery and the reality is women have more pain up to two weeks after rotator cuff repair. There's some good literature that talk about this. And the reality also is that patients that have been on narcotics, they end up needing narcotics for quite a long time and sometimes stay on it for 30 days. So we're not successfully getting people off of narcotics already if they come in like that. And so I think the reality is there's a spectrum, but I think the expectation that they'll have no pain or that, that they might not need that I think is 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 great to set, but I think the reality is not everyone fits that. You know, I just saw a patient today after a proximal humerus fracture, you know, and she did fine early. She actually took very little. She did take narcotics. And the reality is once she started doing therapy more, she's had a lot more pain and we had to sort of cover her for that therapy to be able to do it. Otherwise they get stiff. So I think that that comment in the chat is real. I think, you know, trauma is another one that we haven't talked about. That's a reality of, having a lot of pain and those patients may be somatic, other comorbidities that affect that. And the reality is those patients don't always kind of recover easily after shoulder surgery for me in that period without something. No, I yeah. think the biggest thing that Sharif talks about though is sometimes I will write for a medication and they feel that that is good enough. Writing for Toradol, writing for ibuprofen, writing for meloxicam. So that they feel that they have something that's a rescue for them, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a narcotic. Yeah, that's a great point. And I want to be very clear. I, if they have pain, they will get a refill. I will make sure that they are handled. And I think Vani brings up a great point of trauma. When you, when you, I always explain to the patient, I've had patients that I do a reverse on one side and then they fracture and you do the reverse on the other. And they're like, wow, this one was so much harder. And I said, think of it this way. I went in made a cut in your bone. I got to dissect and do everything I needed to do. On the other side where you broke it, you you broke it and you have these sharp edges that are hitting the soft tissue envelope. Things hurt way bomb more. Bomb went off. Yeah, a bomb went off. Exactly. So now all of a sudden, I can't say bomb went off. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, there's a lot more trauma to that soft tissue envelope. And because of that, I think that's why they definitely have more pain. And you bring up another point with the staggering. So that's another tactic you can use. So you may not necessarily need to use more narcotic. You can, and I've done it where I'm weaning them off, maybe go narcotic, tramadol, so that they can take a little bit, but also have something a little bit less. Then you throw in Tylenol and you throw in an anti-inflammatory and you tell them literally every three or four hours you're doing something. But in the process, they've really not taken any more narcotic than they originally started with. It's just now they're they're staggering it. And you just tell them that you got to stay below the, 
the I I actually the recommended dose to not exceed is four grams of acetaminophen. I tell them thirty two hundred or three point two, yeah. so that I know they won't even get close to that liver toxicity level. But if you can stagger that, and then you tell them put ice on it, many patients can get through this without actually increasing their narcotic usage. But the opiate naive patient is significantly easier to handle than that opiate needing patient that has been on it for other things. Oh, you know, I had a back surgery, I had a knee surgery, and I still have these things that I've been popping on. Well, then they come see you after two months of doing that. And now they have a cuff tear and they've been taking opiates. So those are definitely more difficult to treat. Um, I want to get to say, Ag oh, Agdas had a question. Agdas, you want to, uh, uh, Unmute yourself and show your screen, or just unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, sure. I mean, this was directed to hi, my name is Agnes. I'm uh, Dr. Sebasin's research fellow. And um, after reviewing her talk on high risk pain patients or patients that are at risk for, you know, high pain postoperatively, I guess this question is more directed to Dr. Bashai because I know Dr. Sebasin has a screening process in which she looks at all these risk factors, and maybe her patient population might be different. But wondering if you have your own screening process when considering patients who might be high risk for post-op pain, whether they're having an arthrosco arthroscopic surgery or going on um, undergoing like arthroplasty, do you have your own way of assessing if they have risk factors? I know you mentioned preoperative uh, opioid use, but just curious mm -hmm. if you have any other things you do um, before you know you you go on you go with surgery with this patient, and how do you educate that patient essentially sure. for what they, to expect after? I think there are definitely some scales uh, that you can use. However, I often find that just talking to the patient, asking what they've used and how they've used it, what previous surgeries they've had, when they had previous surgeries, did they require narcotics? How long? What was it? Oftentimes they remember this stuff very, very clearly if they've used a lot of it. And they'll tell you, oh, no, I only use Percocet 5s. I'm allergic to the hydrocodones. Okay, fine. So all of a sudden your brain starts running. And most often though, it, it's a conversation and I explain, they'll, they'll ask me, how are you going to control my pain? I run through what we just talked about a few minutes ago. And oftentimes you can see the comfort level set in that they know that I'm going to take care of them, but they also know that I have a plan going in and I'm not just going to go carve them up and see what happens. I think there, you, you have to have a really nice conversation with them. Um, but it may not be as, as, in depth. And it, if Vani has a scale, I'd love to see it because I would incorporate that in my practice tomorrow. Uh, but oftentimes it's just really just talking to the patient. And you can tell when you tell them, I'm going to give you Norco 7.5s, you get 10 pills. Very quickly, they will say something and say, is that enough? Okay. At that point, I know maybe this is one of those patients. More often than not, they don't say a word and they're very comfortable. And I actually ask them, I go, and if you need anything, make sure, you know, our phones are on every day, call us, we'll call it in. And through Athena, we can write the script right from our homes and even now from our phones. So it is capable to get them medications as soon as they need it, but oftentimes they just don't. Howard, can I Thank talk you. to one of the other questions real quick? Yeah, here? sure, absolutely. Yeah. So one of them, you know, uh, Marty, you said is it's a good, if a good part of the pain is from emitting soft tissues, how much have you changed your surgical approach and retraction during the surgery? I think that that's really like the soft tissue part of it is really an important part that we don't understand well enough. Like why would an arthroscopic surgery that we call minimally invasive be maximally invasive and an arthroplasty surgery, which is open and ripping apart lots of things be much less painful. So I think that part of it is really interesting. And one thing I want to bring up just because, you know, we're in an innovation talk is, you know, I think the future and I like actually texted Scott Sigmund about this is like maybe, you know, with this no pain act and the idea that insurance companies are going to really cater this, maybe they'll start covering some of these other things like cryotherapy, the idea of red light therapy, the idea of laser to help. And maybe there are other alternative ways that we could be treating this shock tissue to successfully help both the rehab part of it, but also the pain levels. And I mean, I really think there is a role for that, that if we had coverage as surgeons, we would write for that much more liberally. But that's the problem. And we go back to what we started with insurance. Yeah. Insurance does not want to pay. It's a criminal enterprise. And so the problem is we are left with having to 
figure out how to make these patients feel better when we know that there's non-narcotic ways to do it, but that are not covered by insurance and not everybody can afford it. So that's the issue. But I agree 100%. I mean, I've talked to Scott at length and just seeing some of the data just from laser has been really amazing. Even some of the patients in, in my town will come in having laser at a different facility and say, that really helped decrease swelling and that helped a lot with my pain. I think going back to your comment, though, about scopes versus uh, open, I think there's a component to it, which is time, time in surgery. If you're efficient and there's not water that is extravasating everywhere in the in the thorax, and that that is significantly less painful if you get a lot of the fluid out. So using a dual flow pump so that water in and water out, you're not putting a ton of fluid in the joint. You're not getting it in the soft tissues. That helps quite a bit. If you're efficient when you have an open procedure and you're not in there for three hours retracting and putting muscles where they're not supposed to be because you need to see, and it's a 30 minute or 40 minute case for a, a reverse and maybe an hour for an anatomic, these all of a sudden these, those patients do better because they have a decreased risk of infection as well. There's a lot of that stuff that goes along with it. So I think w if you're seeing that you have a, a these patients with significantly higher pain, much more than the rest of your colleagues, then maybe it's a technique or a time of surgery issue. And there's plenty of ways to get better at it. I'm not telling you not to do it, but that might be a, a an indication that, hey, maybe I should go do a course. Maybe I should learn a different technique, something like that. Because I think in the long run, it helps your patients to be more efficient. And I think with arthroscopy specifically, you asked for techniques, we all have gone to lower pump pressures. A lot of us have gone to dual pumps. The other way is using Decadron more li religiously or liberally. We've used these steroids. You know, um, Eric Wagner won the near award talking about using a Medrol dose pack post-op. So the idea of maybe containing the soft tissue swelling, the inflammation, the damage, all of those methods might improve our pain levels for our patients. I have a question. Uh, let, let's back up. We decided a lot that Controlling for the first four days is very important, and education is, of course, extremely important. Let's talk about the times before liposomal behavior and your time after liposomal behavior for a second. Was there an aha moment like, whoa, this is seismic? What what was your what your impression when you started using it? I mean, I've used it obviously as a knee surgeon and a hip surgeon, so. First of all, how do you use liposomal pivocaine? Is it interscaling block or is it infiltration in a, in a shoulder? And and what, in your experience, has been the results of that bef as compared to before using it? Or is it a gold standard? If I'm going to take the, the transition, then you go to where you end it, because I'm sure I feel like you kind of got the holy grail and, and there was a middle ground. Yeah, so I back. actually was at the Cleveland Clinic when a lot of these knee studies came out. And they actually banned it at the Cleveland Clinic in Florida, where I was, banned liposomal pivoting. Because of the knee literature, they had done a prospective randomized trial at the Cleveland Clinic in Florida, and they didn't cover that first eight hours. We didn't understand the half-life of it, and they had just terrible results. So they actually stopped using it. So I really had to do a very huge advocacy to study this, and we did a prospective randomized trial, and we looked at local infiltration with liposomal pivoting. Right. So you take your block, but then you also just did this, you know, infiltration methodology. And Paul said he actually published it on sort of how you do it. We did it for both scopes and for both arthroplasty. And we looked at local infiltration. And to me, that's the evolution that then became used as blocks. And what was really interesting with that was we compared that to continuous catheters. OK, so we looked at that compared to continuous. And interestingly enough, the results were equivalent initially. So we looked at that, we published that, and so we showed that it was equal to catheters. But actually, we had a little bit more complication with the catheters than we did with liposomal bivivacate. And so that was, to me, the head-to-head -head of, okay, wait a second, we can go to this. And, and then I think the next step, which Sharif will probably chime in, is the next evolution. We also felt like the cost savings on it and the time and follow-up and all the complications on that continuous catheter were much higher in that study. Now, there's 10 other studies that say equivocal or controversial opposite results, 
But that was my personal first experience on the next step from that catheter coming away from that. So in 18 so. years, I've never used a catheter. And it's because during my fellowship, I saw too many complications. And as the fellow, you're the one who had to handle it. And that was, it would come out or it would break under the skin, or it was just one more pile on top of an ice pack, a sling and everything else that came with it. So it was very uncomfortable for the patient and it was hit or miss if it worked. And that was assuming you had an anesthesiologist that at the time was not using ultrasound, was using actually the um, uh, they were, they were shocking to see, okay, we're right by the nerve. Okay. That's good enough. So it was a, a very different technique back then with ultrasound guidance. I think it's made it much better. However, still it's a piece of plastic under the skin that may or may not be working. It could get clogged. It could get bent, whatever. The problem that I fought for years is that when I wanted to use Expero before it was approved for an interscaling block, anesthesia would get upset because they would lose the opportunity to do an interscaling block and bill for it. Let's call it what it is, because we would do the field block in the V shape that Paul Sethi created and said, this really works. Uh, for my surgery, I had that block and it was great. And it was a field block with Expro and I thought it was wonderful. I had very little pain at all. Now, as it became approved with interscaling blocks in 2018, all of a sudden anesthesia was like, yeah, we're fine, whichever one you want. Now it became a cost issue. But what they never compared was the cost of the catheter, the the the, the motor, and Expro. It was about the same. But they kept on saying they kept then they said, well, it's more expensive than a single shot, but nobody's using single shots, they're using catheters. So it became the the thing if I'm in Times Square and the thing's moving and telling me where it's gonna end, they, they kept on moving that in that shell game. And the Anytime the finish line keeps changing, you wonder it's usually financial. So in this particular case, I think it was we knew it worked. We knew it worked well. It was helpful in, in helping people avoid that storm of pain that was in the first four days. But the issue became, well, now there's an additional cost. Even before the No Pain Act came out, they they said that if a Medicare patient comes through a surgery center, the surgery center will get reimbursed for by Medicare. So essentially there's of no cost to a Medicare patient that is using Expirel in a surgery center, which is where we're doing a lot of our surgeries. So that took that away. Now all of a sudden we're starting to see OnQ and other companies try to combat that and sponsor their own studies and say that those their catheter is still better. But it's if you start realizing it's industry, it's insurance, it's financial. But when we look at the actual data, like Vani just said, and even what was presented over the weekend, that at post-op day two, it works better than anything else. Why wouldn't I want to give that to my patient and control their pain at probably the day that's probably going to be the most pain they're going to have in their entire perioperative period? I will say this is probably one of the most controversial things I've had to deal with with shoulder surgery and pain because, you know, it's 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 controlled by the pharmacy. It's controlled by powers, not physicians in an access to a system. There was a lot of varied usage of it, right? Whether it's soft tissue procedures for general surgery, whether it's other indications. And it became an access issue, which is so interesting to me because it was, whether you believe $150 or $300, such a nominal cost compared to almost everything else we look at. Yeah. And yet it became such a hold by a pharmacist or, you know, I mean, I recently, just this year, got new privileges at a hospital here in, in Wellington. And I got in a heated discussion with the head of pharmacy who said it's absolutely banned from that hospital. And so it's really interesting because they pulled studies from the knee literature and pulled studies from this thing. And they said every surgery is the same and therefore there's no efficacy and they stopped the law. You know, it's very interesting. I um, I gave a lecture one time and uh, talked about my protocol in the knee and, and the use of Expirel. And one of the fellows in the audience said, well, they banned it from a hospital because cost. I said, how much is it? And they said, well, the pharmacist said we spent $240,000 last year. And I said, on one patient? On one patient? And they said, so it's $300. How much money do you get for that operation? And shoulder arthroplasty will get sixteen dollars to $22,000. Um, 
knee replacement will get 26 to 32,000 on average. I've done this work over and over again. And that's at safety net hospitals. So the pack that you use to prep and drape costs $220. You could probably save money if you redo that periodically, but they don't stop you there. It's just they see a single big bill and the pharmacists who should be your partner in decision making and they don't see the patient at 72 hours or 48 hours. They basically see their computer screen. And they don't get the phone calls or the unhappy patients or the poor outcome scores or the stiff shoulder or all right. the things that right. we as surgeons have to deal with. No, yeah. it it's those PNT the PNT committees are are fascinating because like you just said they put it as a lump sum because it's a budget issue. And for them they look and they say their budget is this. They got to keep their budget down and because it falls under pharmacy, they get to pick and choose what happens. But yet you could use an $800 Aquamantis in a shoulder that is completely unnecessary <laughs> and they will not say a word about it. And yeah, right. so it, it that's where I think the issue is everything is siloed. And so you have your OR cost, you have your pharmacy cost, you have your provider cost, your anesthesia cost, and everybody looks at their own spreadsheet, but nobody takes into consideration of the, the big picture that that patient does better with that $200 or $300 expiral shot, you know, and that's where I, I scratch my head. And I think we as pay, as physicians have to be advocates for our, our patients in trying to make sure everybody understands it. And I will say just one yeah. other added thing that I think that, you know, the evolution of using x two now in interscaling blocks, to me, you know, one thing that Shreve and I probably have both, I really think that has been the next game changer. Like I think local infiltration was good. But I think the interscaling block with the x -roll has really been an incredible thing on sort of preventing the rebound pain. So we just talked about this four days and this idea of that two to three day. And so no matter what, I just see it's just a softer curve that, you know, the curve there is just soft. No matter what it is, whether it starts way higher or it starts lower, that fall off is less. Thing. And I can't tell you how many times I've trained residents for 14 years, the middle of the night calls. The 2 a.m. ER visits where patients would get a single shot and then come to your ER or call in the middle of the night. And literally residents would meet. I used to meet and my residents would meet people in the ER to give them a script. because We didn't do electronic prescriptions. And so, I mean, that's just the reality of some of these these things that those conversations on resource utilization. If you look at the whole healthcare system, an ER visit, one ER visit would probably what cover IRA. Probably six hundred that two yeah. Six hundred. But, but here's the bigger death, issue. Right? But here's the bigger issue. That ER visit, that hospital makes six hundred dollars. So they're still net eight hundred positive because they didn't yeah. have to spend two hundred and they got yeah. another visit out of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, so there's no consequence to the hospital saying, Screw you, we're not doing it. <laughs> well, I got it. I have to give you an anecdote of um uh, another another Pacera product that I put got on pharmacy for our hospital, for the outpatient, because we're, we're a vertical uh, delivery system. Uh, I got Zoretta on the PNT committee. I got Zoretta through, which is a long-acting um, um, steroid, um, long-acting cortisone. Um, and so I, was at, I presented it at PNT. Not yet available in the shoulder, but yes. Yes. Not yet. Yeah. Same <laughs> was in relief. Yeah. Yeah, we're on one of the studies, but yes. So, so I, I, I presented it to p and and immediately the head of pharmacy said, we can't do it, it's too expensive. And I said, this committee has no right or function to discuss finance. This committee is only to discuss safety and efficacy of a product. You want to discuss finance, you put the CFO and me in the room. And the other physicians did a mutiny on the PT committee and said, that's right. We have to stop just talking about costs. Uh, you know, I have an equation which I have shown my CFO, which he likes R minus C equal W, gross revenue minus the checks you write due to surgeon behavior gives the hospital working capital. So if your behavior is to give Expero, 
as an interscaling block. And that patient is much more satisfied and comes back for more surgery, more, you know, the working capital is higher across the board, but it's interesting how, you know, you, you can take them on the PNT committee to some extent and say, what do you know about the finances of this operation? Um, now, I, again, it's easier as a chairman to, you know, go in there <laughs> and, to be and clear. beat some heads, you know. Um, but uh, nonetheless, it was, it was a point well taken. I mean, I, you know, I mean, so I think that that works out pretty well. Um, but what you just said is fascinating because like we just said earlier in the conversation, pain was the fifth vital sign. Yes. For these committees, cost is the fifth vital sign. Correct. So there's, it really has no relevance in anything. It doesn't talk about efficacy. It doesn't talk about outcomes. It doesn't talk about patient satisfaction. It talks about cost, which is in theory, completely irrelevant. Now I get that there is relevancy when it talks about the solvency of a business and a hospital system. However, like we just said, the difference of a few hundred bucks per patient, yes, will add up, but look at the gross revenue, or I should say the net revenue on those patients over a course of a year. And then they're going to say, Oh, I went to hospital system X and it was great. I'm going to keep going back there. It's walking over dollars to pick up pennies. Absolutely. Larry, and I think the question oh, yeah. got right up Ara, here in the thing from Laura to just sort of, do we think, what do we think the impact of no pain legislation? And Laura, I think it's just a perfect segue of, I think it's going to be a game changer. I think it's going to completely, you know, just to talk about what Sharif's talking about, they want pennies, right? They want any penny they can pinch. And if they're going to get reimbursed, first of all, which has been shown now that it's going to happen for Xperl every time, and they could get these bonus reimbursements for the no pain, I think it's going to be a no brainer of everybody suddenly now we're going to have an onrush of every pharmacy committee approving it, every value based you know utilization committee suddenly saying, "Oh my God, we've been for this the whole time." Yeah, right. And I really think it's going to be a change. I believe a sort of our direction in our conversation that we have. I'm hopeful, you know. To incentivize a hospital to make sure the patient is satisfied and has the appropriate pathways to keep people healthy and pain-free or close to pain-free is going to, like Vani says, be a game changer. But it's going to be ironic because now they're going to get the same press gainy scores, but the difference will be that they're actually doing the things necessary to keep them out of pain without narcotics. I think the only thing that, that Ira brings up that I am concerned about is the fact that it's not a no narcotic, it's a no pain. Correct. And the reality is, is that that's a really tall order to to create in a healthcare system, right? And so will it create some variations in behavior that might not be incentivized for the right thing for the patient? For example, keeping people in the hospital longer because they get paid for it to then, you know, to get this expectation of discharging them with no pain or name the other sort of thing of the idea of if patients can't have pain, then our expectation will be we'll have to treat all kinds of things, whether we understand it or not, in maybe a different methodology. So there is some backlash that's concerning with the idea of no pain, just like pain is the fifth vital sign and you have to have a zero score before you leave our hospital. Right. No, I think you bring up a good point, but I think, like you said, no pain act is kind of a weird name because the thought is like, what, you're not going to give me narcotics. So when it passed, I posted something on my social media that said, I'm really excited about this day, worked hard to do it. I, you know, pointed out some of the people that were very influential in doing it. And I got some in the comments, some really angry people saying, how are you going to take my narcotics away? You should go to hell. I look forward to seeing you in an alley, blah, blah, blah. And I, you know, I didn't engage, but the reality is just like you said, we're not taking away pain me pain meds and things appropriate for people that need it. This is more of an acute pain setting, not the chronic pain setting. And this is going, there has to be pathways set up for patients that will come in and say, I don't want narcotics. We have to make sure that we have pathways set up for those patients. So the No Pain Act is going to be, I think, a great way 
so that a patient can actually pick from their menu what they want. And we have a, a pathway to help them get there. And in the process, have all the things at our disposal in order to get them there with the least amount of narcotic use as possible. I think that's great. I mean, I think that that is the noble focus of, of the No Pain Act. Mm -hmm. uh, I really mean that. Um, you know, I, I work in a safety net community and there are many social determinants of health. Vonda, you have a similar uh, situation in, in parts of, uh, of Florida and, um, and I'm sure, Sharif, you have your share there as well. Um, where, as most Joey topic sessions, we end up getting to the end like in a blink of an eye. Um, so, um, I am going to ask both of, uh, my panel, our panelists, uh, cause this is open mic. It's not my thing uh, to sum up and I'll, I'll start with Sharif and then I'll ask Vani to bring us home. Give us a little summary and tidbits you want people to come, go home with. I, I think the, what I would like to leave everybody with is that there are opportunities to help our patients that don't just include narcotics. Narcotics are, are good. They help people, but it shouldn't be the sole way we control pain. Donnie Buford is on a dear friend who does things in the clinic with PRP and BMA to help with inflammation. There's things we can do in clinics that can start this process. As we move into the OR, we need to fight for our patients. We need to make sure that we know what's out there. For me, Expril is invaluable for my shoulder patients, and I want to make sure, and even my lower extremity patients, now that the adductor canal block is approved. So these are things that I want to make sure are at at the beck and call of me and more, more importantly, accessible by my patient so that we can control their pain. And I think that we all have to work together. We all have to keep looking at research. We all have to keep figuring out a way to do what's best for our patients, irrelevant of what committees, hospitals, and insurance carriers want to tell us to do. Excellent. Vani, want to bring us home? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that the, 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 the conversation summation to me is we've been incredibly successful as a community, as surgeons to, to put our patients first, to find and study our outcomes and to understand that. And I think I'm really proud to see how most of our practices have evolved and patient satisfactions, patients' expectations have evolved too. And I think that the future is bright. I think that I'm hopeful that as we continue to publish and come together as a community and sort of share best practices that we continue to lead in the right direction for the right reasons. And I'm hopeful that these type of incentives of no pain and, and hopefully can fight sort of the idea of cost being the only guidance of our healthcare system. So, you know, I, I think that we can really understand and best relate to the fact that the, the, the success is in, you know, in the methods, right? We can show that we're proven that. And I think we're proud to say that patients really do well after shoulder surgery. And it's because of our community and because of the things we've done. This is excellent. Uh, I want to thank uh, Sharif and Vani and everyone who contributed questions and for being here tonight. Uh, this will be, uh, this is recorded and will be edited and probably available tomorrow on the Joey uh, YouTube site uh, for Enduring Media. Uh, and I sincerely want to thank everybody for coming tonight. And it was a, a great evening. So thank you.